So I'm really glad that you could uh, come along tonight. And I just want to echo what Jonathan said there before about acknowledging the Gadigal people here and bringing greetings from my people, the Wiradjuri, and on my mother's side, the Gummeroy people as well. It has been an amazing uh, and bewildering couple of weeks for me, I, I have to say. I could never have anticipated that a speech that I gave just last October as part of a debate organised by the BBC could catch fire in such a way that it would not only resonate here in Australia but would also find an audience internationally. As Noel Pearson said, and, and I'm incredibly humbled by his words, for the first time we were speaking about these dark, uncomfortable truths in the public space, that we were no longer people yelling it from the margins and the fringes. These wasn't a voice of protest, but this was something that came from the heart of the country, from our place as the first peoples, and our sense of belonging and place in this country. That it was not something that I could even ever have anticipated, and it wasn't something I'd planned. It wasn't a speech that I had written. It was something that I wanted to say in the moment. The debate was focused on the question, is racism destroying the Australian dream? And I wanted to speak to the truth as we saw it. The fact that for all that Australia has built, the fact of Australia's exceptional standing in the world and its position as a country that many people in the world envy, we have paid a price for that. That the original grievance that lies at the heart of settlement has not only still not been resolved, but it continues to shadow our lives, define our lives, and in many cases, far too many cases, crush our lives still today. As I said in the speech, were I speaking for the other side, were I a white Australian, I would proudly and defiantly defend this country, but I stand on the side of my ancestors and the view is so very different from where we are. And I wanted to reflect tonight on my own life and the arc of my own life and what it is like to live with the weight of history and to try to navigate the racial by byways and back roads of Australia. Jonathan mentioned my father, and his life probably, and far more than mine, probably exemplifies the road that we've all been on and the changes that we've seen in Australia. In the 1940s, he was a young boy, and his father had gone to fight in World War II, a man who was still not acknowledged and recognised as a citizen in his own country, putting on the uniform as so many Indigenous people did to go and fight for Australia. He fought in Tobruk. And my father was raised during those years by his grandfather, a man named Budyan. And Budyan, my great-grandfather, was a Wiradjuri man who spoke seven different indigenous languages but was dismissed by white people as uneducated and brutish and savage. And he spoke to my father in language. Whenever they were together, they only spoke Wiradjuri. And one day they were in the main street of Griffith, where they were living, and he yelled to my father in language and the police overheard it and arrested him, charged him, I think, with offensive language, but we all know what it was about. It was about enforcing the silencing of our language and he went to jail for it. He came out and from that moment on would only speak to any of the children away from white people out in the bush. And our language was lost on the streets. The language that they would speak and we would hear co commonly spoken within a generation disappeared to the point when I was growing up we had a strange mix, a strange patois of Wiradjuri words and English words, but no sense of what language means, no sense of how language defines you and defines your sense of place. As my father always said, 
Language doesn't tell you who you are, it tells you where you are. For our people, it is where you are. And if you take away your, your, your language, if you take away your voice, you take away the way you think, you take away your mind. And over the years, my father had borne the brunt of the full Australian racist experience. And I don't use that word lightly, and I don't use that word in any way to diminish white Australia or to make us white Australians and feel guilty or share a sense of shame or blame. I don't think that's what we're about now, but the harsh facts of his life were that if you were a black Australian growing up at that time, you were excluded from education, you were excluded from employment, you faced the intrusion of the state, the loss of your privacy and dignity, you could be told where you could live, you could be told who you could marry, and in his case, you could be told what language you could speak. And he grew up, as many Aboriginal kids did, on missions and riverbanks and his father came back from the war to a country that was still segregated, a country in which he couldn't even share a drink with the men that he'd fought and served with. He came back to Australia and in full uniform, when trying to change trains in Tamora, a country town about 100 miles from Griffith, was told, you can't get on this train, you're back home now. This was the life that they lived. This was the reality of their life. This was the inheritance that my father, this was the inheritance of my father's family. So my dad grew up to carve out a life any way that he possibly could. And a man of limited education and a black man had only his hands. But his father had taught him that you define your life that you take charge of your life. And despite what others may think or say or do, you get up and you face that every day. And he did. He got up and he worked in sawmills. He lost the tips of three fingers working to put food on the table for us. He worked as an itinerant labourer. We were a nomadic family that just moved from one town to another. My mother's story, she was a Gummelroy woman born in Coonabarabran to a Gummelroy father and a white mother, a woman who in the 1930s Australia crossed that racial line and walked into a world that accepted her, a black world that accepted her and walked away from a white world that shunned her, who would then live on the fringes of that white world, who would be searched routinely whenever she would go through town, have her pram upturned to search for any alcohol she may have been allegedly trying to smuggle back out on the mission to the blacks. My grandfather, my, my, dad, my mum's dad, had to sneak away with his mates if they dared to have a beer and would often be arrested and then chained and paraded through the streets of Coonabarabran for everyone to see. And one time he was arrested for drinking but not taken to the police station, taken to a tree, chained to the tree, and left there. Left there for his children to see as they walked to school the next morning. They lived on the margins of that society in tin humpies with a long, along with a whole group of other Indigenous people trying to find a foothold in white Australia that still excluded them. And it was a life that meant you could be moved on and were moved on and often violently and brutally at the point of a gun whenever the police or a developer decided that they wanted that land back. And it happened to them, it happened to my grandfather and my mother's family. So my mother and father emerged out of this post-frontier world, a world where Indigenous people in New South Wales were remaking their universe and reimagining themselves. People who had the blood of white Australians in them but had no place in white Australia itself. And these people came together to form a new society emerging from the missions and the riverbanks and small towns. And I was born into this society. This was the world 
that I came to know. In 1963, when I was born, we still were not counted among the citizens of Australia. We weren't counted in the census. We were still tallied with the flora and fauna. My birth was not recognised or, or, uh, or, or, or recorded officially because we weren't counted. I reflected in the speech that in 1963, the dispossession was still going on. For anyone who imagines that this was something that happened in the decades after 1788, in 1963, it was still happening. And I reflected on a community of Mapoon in Queensland where the police came under cover of darkness with guns drawn, ordered everyone from their homes, burned those homes to the ground because the land was being given to a bauxite mine. And the people still today reflect on that night, remember that night as the night of the burning. This is 1963, when I was born. So this is not history, this is a lived experience in my lifetime. As an Aboriginal family, we lived a life on the run. My mother would feed me stories about her family, and what it was like, particularly being a family with a white mother, and the vulnerability of the intrusion of the state and the welfare officers and the members of her family who were taken. She used to write poems about the welfare officers coming and read them to me. Moving from town to town looking for work was a way for my parents to stay one step ahead, just out of the grasp of the state, never infiltrating white Australia circling white Australia and trying to stay one step ahead of the state. We would move from town to town. I tallied more than 13 different changes of school before I'd even emerged from primary school. Every one of my siblings was born in another small country town in New South Wales. Often I wouldn't go to school for weeks at a time as we packed up and moved somewhere else if Dad found work in another, in another small town. But I grew up with this other education. I grew up with a passion for, for reading and stories. I would seek out books wherever I was. If I was in a town, I'd go to the library or I would get books from the second-hand stores that we used, my mum used to go to to find clothes for us. And I grew up with the stories of my family, the stories that my father would tell me about his ancestors, the stories that my mother would tell me about her family. And there was one particular story in one place that always resonated, that had a, a mystical attachment for me. It was a town of Canoundra in central western New South Wales. And every time we'd drive through there, my father would always say, this is our land. This is where we're from. And there'd be the name Grants on the shop fronts and on the, 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 the gates of the, of the properties. And I learned about where we came from and how we got our name, how we were born as a family out of the frontier of Australia, how an Irish convict named John Grant was banished for his involvement in the rebellion against the British, his mother, his sister, his other brother, all executed. So as not to make a martyr of the family, he was sent to Australia, served his time, won his emancipation, was given a parcel of land, and built that into an empire that by the time he died, he was reputedly the richest Irish Catholic in the colonies. But he also left something else. He left us. In between his two marriages to white, respectable, <laughs> respectable women, he'd also had children to Aboriginal women. And we were it. And I uncovered this secret after years of hearing the story from my father by going back to Canoundra and searching through the, the lists of unmarked graves. There was nothing official about us except this list of unmarked graves, and here they all were, a whole family of grants. 
and all of them sharing the same name, the same names as his white family. If there was a white Mary, there was a black Mary. If there was a white Elizabeth, there was a black Elizabeth. Made it easy, I suppose, to remember exactly who they were. If there was a white William, there was a black William. And the black Williams and Marys and Elizabeths and Selinas all worked for the white Marys and Elizabeths and Selinas in this enormous property. One family, I reflect on this in the book that I've just written, out of this experience, this frontier conflict, after the declaration of martial law in Bathurst, when my people, Wiradjuri people, could and were shot on sight, this family emerges. But as I, said in the, as I say in my book, one family went on to become Australians and the other family became outcasts. And that was my family. And when I would drive through this town and I would see the Grant names and look at the Grant properties, my father would tell me, this is our place. So I grew up with this great sense of story and tradition and belonging. Never a sense, never, that we were a people destroyed. Never a sense that we were a people vanquished, a people who had vanished, a people defeated. Never. Never a sense that we were a people without a culture. For everything that we heard, everything I was told at school, how the Aboriginal people vanished from the frontier and how Australia was peacefully settled. How Blacks and Lawson and Wentworth crossed the Blue Mountains and miraculously found this interior. I'd go home and I would see the other side of that frontier. And this sense of pride that we belong to that. I don't think I even heard or had a sense of us as being Aborigines. We were Wiradjuri people. I heard that word from birth, Wiradjuri people. That was our identity. If you ask my father today, he's a Wiradjuri man. He doesn't seek to be identified in, in any other way. And so we, we lived with these traditions. We lived with this culture. We lived with our family. We would move from town to town, picking up relatives and dropping them off as we went. My grandfather would come and live with us periodically, uncles, aunts, cousins. It was a revolving door. Always, as I say, staying one step ahead, trying to stay out of the grasp, trying to get a foothold. My father and mother hoping that if you go to work, if you scrub another floor, if you chop another log, that you put food on the table and you buy another day. And my abiding memory of my father, if I close my eyes, I can always see him in the same way, lying in a bath that my mother had heated up the, the water in the old copper that we used to have because we didn't have electricity, to make this hot bath for him and to see him laying there, the, the water from, in the bath black from sap and blood, and him laying there with his eyes closed and just aching with the pain of staying alive and hoping that you get up again and you give your family another chance. And that's what I inherited. That sense that they had laid down their lives for me and they had given me an opportunity and a chance. We finally moved back to Griffith when I was around about 13. Griffith was always the spiritual home for us. We'd come and go and I was born there and all of my family had pulled together from different parts of a Wiradjuri country and relocated there in the, the mission in Griffith. And I was at school and this was a, a particular turning point. You look for those moments in your life when you make a decisive break. We were called to the principal's office at school when I was about 14. Me and a group of other Aboriginal boys and we were all told that you're approaching the age when you're no longer legally required to be at school, there's no place for you here, you're better off out. And I remember at the time thinking, I don't want to go. <laughs> I, I, I certainly didn't want to be a sawmiller like my dad. I, I, 
I didn't have the stomach, the physical capacity for that sort of work. I had no great ambitions, but I just knew that I didn't want to go. And fate intervened. My father got another job. It was on the outskirts of Canberra. So we moved again. My dad got another job in a mill. I disappeared into white suburban 1970s Canberra. Made my sister and I the only Aboriginal kids in the school. And I vanished. And for a couple of years, I lived this life of invisibility, just trying to live an, as anonymously and as low-key as possible and just get through. I got through school and I, I, I graduated again with no sense of ambition, no sense of what the world could offer to me other than what my parents had shown me, which is just that you get up and you face the day. And I found myself in a job delivering mail and photocopying at the Australian Institute of Aboriginal Studies. And after lying low, after leaving this rich culture that I'd been bred and brought up in, into white suburban Canberra where I put my head down and disappeared and re-emerged in this place of incredible learning, the white people there were from England and America and Germany and they, they were fascinated by us and they saw us as, as human beings and people of worth and value. And there were black people there, Aboriginal people there studying. And there was a library. And this love of learning and stories and books caught fire. And very quickly I'd gone from delivering the mail and photocopying to hanging around the library and reading whatever I could and spending time with the you know, with the, the anthropologists as they talked to me about culture and history and, and, and connecting me with artefacts that were, were housed in the, uh, in the museum there. And one woman intervened again fortuitously in my life. It was Marcia Langton, who was uh, now Professor of Chair of Indigenous Studies at Melbourne University, who was studying at the time. And she pulled me aside and she said, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, well, I'm quite happy doing what I'm doing. I had no aspirations beyond delivering mail. And she said, your parents didn't go through what they've gone through for you to deliver mail. She said, you, you graduated from high school? And I said, yeah. And she said, how did you go? I said, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I had never, and to this day still have never even opened my results. It was completely immaterial to me. And she said, OK, I'll find out. She went, she found out, and then she said, you know, you can go to university, you've done well. She filled out the forms, enrolled me into the University of New South Wales, connected me with a whole group of people, and I turned up at the university and suddenly there were people like me, young Aboriginal people from New South Wales who had shared the same experiences, who were now pushing at the boundaries of Australia, tapping on the window, you know, we're inside now. We're learning, we're reading, we're discovering our identity, testing that identity, forging this sense of ourselves beyond what we'd been told, that we were invisible and worthless and couldn't amount to anything and shouldn't even be in the education system. And like all people, I went through that period of, in, of, of, of intense sort of awakening where there was an anger and a rejection and a roiling sort of gut-wrenching reckoning with my own past and what had put us here and, and a hatred, to be honest with you, for, for quite a while. But my journey from there to here has been about opening up. From university, I got into journalism. Again, fortuitously, somebody knew somebody who said this person would, would be good at this. And another world opened up for me, a world of politics and history. And Within a short, brief period, the boy who was delivering mail at the age of 18, by the age of 23, was a political correspondent for the ABC in Canberra. By the age of 28, was the London correspondent for Seven Network. A few short years later, I'm working for CNN. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
CNN opened up the world again for me. Hong Kong. We lived in Beijing. I then moved to the Middle East. I covered the wars of Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan. I ventured into secluded countries, Myanmar as it was, cut off from the rest of the world, North Korea, this country still in a state of war, technically with the United States and South Korea. And as an indigenous person, I felt liberated. For the first time in my life, I wasn't living with the weight of our history. I didn't meet people across the chasm of that history. I met people as a human being. And you have no idea, well, indigenous people in the room perhaps would, would share this, but what it is like to have that yoke lifted from your neck for someone to go, you're good at what you do. That's it. My cameraman was an Iranian. My other cameraman was a Canadian. My producer was an Ethiopian. Another one was a Chinese man. And, you know, I worked alongside Pakistanis, Indians, British people, American people, everything you could think of, Korean people. And we were just doing a job. And I was just another person. But in my journeys and my reporting, I gravitated to those people who I identified with on some intensely innate, deep level, looking into the eyes of a Pakistani refugee on the border of Afghanistan and seeing the eyes of my cousins looking back at me, meeting a Palestinian man living in Iraq who had fled after the, crea the creation of the State of Israel, had fled the West Bank and had gone to Baghdad looking for another life and only for war to come again. And remembering how he went into the room, he came out and he had a jar of soil. He said, this is my home. And I carry this home with me every day. He knew that I knew what he went through. We had this, these incredible connections. Many a South African man in Soweto, as apartheid was being lifted and Mandela was freed and moving towards being elected the first black president and him inviting me into his home to share a meal, but not just a meal, to share how our lives were shaped by history. And it awakened me, it opened my eyes to Australia. I learned more about my country in the back blocks of Pakistan and Afghanistan and Baghdad, and North Korea and China than I probably ever learned here. I learned that our struggle as Indigenous people is part of the great universal struggle. The struggle to live lives of dignity and meaning and hold on to that sense of identity of who we are when all certainty has been removed. And to be honest with you, it was a searing and often brutal experience for me. I covered war and terrorism up front. I saw, without wanting to overly embellish it, I saw the bodies of children blown to pieces. I saw countries divided by hatred and politics. And I reflected always on my own country. As the Chinese talk about their resurgence in terms of reversing the 100 years of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers, that told me about my country. As an Afghan spoke of generations, centuries of resisting foreign invasion, holding on to language and culture, that spoke to my people. As that Palestinian man carried a jar of soil in his hand and spoke of home, that spoke to my people. And eventually, my journey brought me back to Australia, a place that, to be honest, I'd fled and probably, in some ways, contemplated staying away from forever. Circumstances conspired to bring me back, and I emerged back into a country that was still fighting old battles. 
where my people still lived with the weight of that history, were still dying 10 years younger, locked up in numbers that just would shame Australia internationally. 3% of the population, 27% of the prison population were dying of diseases long rid from Australia. And I struggled with this sense of being back home and what home means to me. What it is like to go back to my country and feel the pull of the earth, to breathe more deeply and sleep more, 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 more deeply as well. And reconcile that sense of belonging with the harsh reality that my people still live with today and confront my own measure of success through a mixture of good fortune and hard work and where that placed me as well in relation to my own people who still suffer. And then we had the Adam Goods story. And suddenly, that history was no longer buried. That story that we may sometimes read about or it may be on the political pages of the newspaper we may hear something about in a remote community was right where Australians lived. It was in the grandstands, it was on the hills, it was, in the, it was on the football field. And we couldn't turn away from that. Suddenly we had to confront, is this who we are? Do we boo this man because he's black? Is that what this is about? Did he challenge us and we react in a way that rejects him? And I wrote about this for The Guardian. I'd spent weeks just grappling with this. What does this tell us? Who are we? Is this, is this my country? And, and, and saying to my wife, and, and to be honest with you, at times in tears, saying, should, should we just get out of here? And she said, you should write. Just write something. Write what you feel. And I wrote for The Guardian, and I said, I can't speak to what lies in the hearts of the people who boo Adam Goods. But I can tell you what we hear, and that we heard a howl of humiliation that echoes across the 200 years of suffering, dispossession, and injustice that we have, that my family has been forged out of. That's all I could say. And for the first time in my life, people listened. It resonated. People said, I've never heard this before. I didn't know. I had people, and some people you'd be surprised to hear from, actually, people you may identify with the sort of right-wing Murdoch press who were calling me saying, you have changed my mind. And then the speech. And again, this extraordinary reaction where people are saying, we're ready to have this conversation. And from my point of view, the boy who was angry and hurt and full of hate at times at university had gone out into the world and had seen the worst of the world and came back to Australia to say, if that's the worst of the world, we're not that. That white Australia, for all that it has done to us, is still an extraordinary place. And that white Australians... Australians of all backgrounds who've come and contributed and share in creating this country, a prosperous, stable, peaceful, tolerant, multicultural country, have every right to be proud of that. And it's not my right to diminish that or reject that or to say, don't celebrate on Australia Day. You have every right to be proud of that. But if this is a great country, and I have no doubt that it is, then surely it can stand the measure of that greatness. Surely, 3% of the population should not die 10 years younger than everyone else. And I just want to finish where I started. And what gives me heart and what tells me about the arc of justice that we're seeing in this country. The boy whose grandfather was jailed for speaking his language two years ago that man, my father, who lost fingers working in sawmills to put food on the table for us, received a Doctor of Letters from Charles Sturt University 
for writing Wiradjuri Dictionary. It had never been done before. And that boy, my father, whose grandfather was jailed for speaking his language, was awarded an Order of Australia for saving the language that this country wanted to silence. Now, we are not a remarkable family. We are a black family. We are a Wiradjuri Gomoroi family. We are like the families of indigenous people right across this country who get up every day and raise their children and go to work and pay their taxes and coach their local football teams just like you do. But we do it with the weight of that history and surely we can lift that weight from our necks, finally. Thank you.